So, first thing first, Ken, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm not too bad. Uh, not too bad at all. So, what are you in again? Sorry? What country are you in? I'm in the Netherlands. Netherlands. Uh, yes. Awesome. <laughs> I'm sure you've been here uh, many a time to play. I have, yes. <laughs> I've always enjoyed it. Oh, that's good to hear. That's always good to hear. So before we get into the new Fifth Angel album, I'd like to jump back to the beginning. Now, I came across um, an interview where you said Fifth Angel was the high school band, you, your high school band. It's kind of what you started, even though you did some music around that time. Uh, what are your memories of kind of being a teenager and finding like-minded people and, and getting into a band? Well, it was really funny. Um, initially, Ted and Ed, they were in high school. I was in junior high and they saw me play at a talent show. And uh, I think I was 14 at the time or 13. I think I was 13 years old. And, uh, you know, we actually jammed and, and they were like, you know, wow, the, you know, this kid can actually play. And so... <laughs> So uh, we started, you know, working on music together uh, for some years and uh, we, we didn't have success uh, for a long time. Uh, and then there's a period where we, we kind of sort of, I won't say disbanded, but we, we kind of um, took a little hiatus. And then Ed and, and uh, Ted started working with James Bird. And uh, that's when we started working on the, you know, the first Fifth Angel album. Queensryche came out in, I think it was 83. And we saw what they did. You know, they, we actually, I think I remember talking to Chris DeGarmo at Lake Sammamish before their, their album came out. And, and he was telling us, yeah, we went in the studio and we recorded and, and, you know, it's just money, you know, we had to take the risk. And, you know, we went, we went and did this uh, EP and, you know, next thing we knew we were hearing it on the radio and they were in Kerrang magazine and, they were on tour with Dio and all these things happened and, and they weren't, they didn't play clubs. They didn't do like what normal bands did. Normal bands would learn cover songs and they would go out and play and beat their head against the wall playing clubs. And then we, when we saw that happen with Queensryche, we said, Hey, this is what we do. We, you know, get the money together. We make a great record and, and then we, you know, try and shop it. And we shopped it to all these different labels and nobody picked it up except for, uh, shrapnel Mike Varney at shrapnel heard the the four song demo that we did I think it had yeah. fifth angel um wings of destiny um maybe cry out the fools and uh one other song I think maybe fall out um so anyways Mike Varney heard the um heard the demo and and uh he signed the band and and Mike Varney had to deal with Roadrunner in the Netherlands actually sure. Uh, and Roadrunner at the time uh, was run by Sace Wessels. I remember being a kid, you know, I'm talking to him on the phone, you know, we're <laughs> talking about points and, and all this stuff that I didn't really know much about at the time. Uh, but, you know, Roadrunner became this, you know, massive record company with Slipknot and, you know, all these huge metal bands. And, uh, but back then they were kind of like a, a smaller label. And, uh, but we were happy to be on Roadrunner and Shrapnel and, uh, the record came out and sort of did, you know, we kind of did what Queens right did <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> um, you know, the record came out, it started making a bunch of noise. Uh, we ended up getting signed by Epic Records in New York City. And so that really is how, you know, Fifth Angel came into, you know, actually being a, a real, you know, worldwide entity at that point. Sure. And those those four songs that you initially written and, and then the rest that kind of came after uh, to form that first album. How do you look back at the creativity of you guys, of, of the, uh, the the guys in the band and kind of is, is it a are, are some of the remnants still there or is it kind of the core of what you were trying to do still still uh, inside you in terms of uh, musicality and creativity? I do think it is. Yes. I mean, I think um, anybody who listens to the last album, The Third Secret, or listens to the new album, I think they're going to say, obviously, you know, that those those threads are still there. You know, you can listen yeah. to all four albums and, you know, there's definitely definitely commonalities. You know, there's themes that are consistent. Um, so I, I do think that there there is uh, there is a, a cool like 
whatever was created when we were young, you know, the, those dreams and those visions and, and, you know, those uh, concepts are still something that drives us today. Yes. And I don't know, you, you mentioned the word dreams, and I don't know if this was as, as kind of simple as I'm going to put it now, but, but then uh, the kind of the grunge movement started and, and, out out of uh, Seattle as well, but that kind of <laughs> replaced a lot of the popular music at the time. Well, grunge didn't, you know. I would say it, it wiped out everything, <laughs> you know. It, you know, and ironically, it was from Seattle, you know, which is really weird because you know when we were in the middle of Seattle, like in terms of like we had Metal Church and Queensrÿche and Air Apparent and Fifth Angel, and you know we had kind of a metal scene going. And as a matter of fact. Uh, our producer, Terry Date, uh, he went on to produce Soundgarden and Deftones and Pantera. And, you know, the Fifth Angel album was the first album he ever did. That was his first record ever. <clears throat> and it was signed by Epic, which tells you something. You know, it's like we did a great job. We were all very young. You know, we were trying to do everything with excellence. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is I can go listen to that first album today You know, and, and we were very precise and we were very exact and we were trying to make a great album. And I'm very proud of that record. It sounds like we had Pro Tools and we didn't have Pro Tools. You know, it was all two inch tape. You know, everything's in tune and in time and it's tight and it's powerful and there's energy and there's life. And, um, you know, it's really something that, uh, you know, is fantastic to go back and listen to and go, you know, wow, we were so young when we did this, but we cared. You know, we cared and we tried to make something great. And I think I think it stood the test of time. And and I think, you know, I think, you know, we did make something I feel, you know, was sure. great art. It's lasting to this day. People are still talking about it this many years later. Sure. And, and what I find interesting about that is because, uh, well, obviously today, bands like Soundgarden, as you mentioned, and Nirvana, they're well, well respected for what they did and all, everything. But at the time, uh, What were the feelings within kind of the community that you were playing in? Because I can imagine, like you said, you made really cool music. And then for some reason, kind of outside of music, almost, it, 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 got, it failed to get any, or not failed to get any, but traction was harder to come by. So, so well, it, was, it was wiped out. I mean, if you okay. look at the grunge era, I mean, even bands like Megadeth and Judas Priest and Metallica, I mean, they all had a very dark period there. I mean, You know, Rob Halford went off to try, uh, you know, a different thing with Fight and um, Metallica wasn't doing well. I mean, in, in Europe, they were still doing well, but in the United States, nothing. Um, Megadeth was was really getting hurt, too. So it's like it wasn't just us. It was anything from that era was like moved off the table. It was like, get out of here, you know, just and, and the only time I can think of in music history You know, that that really happened. I mean, I guess disco in the 70s, I guess mm -hmm. there's a point in uh, music history where, you know, people were burning disco records and stuff. And that was kind of like what happened to us. You know, like people were, you know, we lost our record deal. Um, you know, like uh, it was a very dark time in terms of, um, you know, yeah, it just looked like, you know, you guys are done, get out. You know, it was pretty much the message. Uh, and, and it was mostly... I won't say it's necessarily from the fans because I don't think the fans ever really deserted us. I think it was really the, the, the business, the industry deserted us and just said, you guys are done, get out. And, uh, and it was very tough and it's very hard to fight against in that day because there was no, you know, it wasn't like the internet. You could just keep doing your stuff. You could keep putting out music and put out videos on YouTube. Like now, They can't really do that to you. They can't just say, hey, this music is gone because mm -hmm. now you have the Internet, you got YouTube, you know, you can still connect with your fans. But back then, if you didn't have a record deal, it was impossible to, to really connect with your fans. So it was very unfortunate timing. And if you look at the grunge scene, you know, they only lasted like a few years. I mean, it was like maybe two years. And, you know, you look at the bands that lasted. I mean, Pearl Jam's still around. Allison Chain singers, you know, died. Uh, Soundgarden singer died. Nirvana singer died. Um, you know, it was short lived. Uh, you know, and and I, I mean, I think they had some cool songs, but you know, if you look at the bands they were making fun of, you know, like Kiss and Iron Maiden and Metallica, and you know, they were making fun of these kinds of bands. These are the bands that are playing stadiums today. So, sure. you know, I kind of look at it and just go. 
you know, yeah, grunge, very unfortunate, very bad timing for us. Very sad story. I wish I wish it did not happen. And then I, I think the last thing about this is the the, uh, the zeitgeist of the music. The grunge was very depressive and then very down. And, and the music around uh, the grunge era was very optimistic and energetic. So it was such a um, dichotomy as well, in a way. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, and, and again, being from Seattle, you know, we were watching all this and, and you know, you're just going like, you know, wow. You know, and 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 some of it I loved, you know, like Nirvana Teen oh, Spirit. Course. You go like, OK, you know, that was just a killer track. And, you know, they, there were some great songs from that era. But but if you look at by and large, the whole body of work, you know, I don't think it, it necessarily you know, I don't think it necessarily stood the test of time that I can see. I mean, I guess Pearl Jam's still out there playing big venues. Um, and, and, you know, an offshoot like Foo Fighters, everybody loves Foo Fighters, of course. Um, so, but yeah, if you look back, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about it, but I feel like it had, you know, it was, didn't last long. It was a very short thing. And unfortunately, it just, you know, wiped us out, which was mm -hmm. really, you know, Like you said, it was like running into a you know freight train, and you know there was nothing we could do about it, and it wasn't our fault. And uh, and it was really it's 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 sad, you know it's a, it's a sad uh, turn of events. You mentioned kind of the timelessness uh, that music can have, then, and the fact that the band is now back. Uh, well, you've been back for a while, but the, it, what does that tell you about the type of music that you make, and, and the fact that people, new generations, uh, can find stuff in in that music? Well, it's actually surprising to us, too, because, you know, especially the lyrical content, you know, like on the new album, uh, When Angels Kill, we actually made a cohesive story out of uh, we wove all of the subject matter from most of the previous songs over the last three albums. And and we wove it into a cohesive story. And uh, the one thing that I do find fascinating is how young we were and what we were talking about is still totally relevant today. You know, like deception in the media, betrayal, uh, war, uh, terrorist attacks, um, you know, all these different things that we were talking about, you know, way back then are absolutely, you know, could be out of the headlines today. So I think it's kind of surprising uh, to me personally, you know, that, that we're looking back going, you know, wow, this this really holds up. And, you know, we just played the Kit Festival and You know, all everyone was singing along to every song, <laughs> and, okay. and it was so amazing. You know that we're we're going. You know, these are songs we wrote. You know, years and years and years ago, and you know everybody knows them and everybody loves them, and and uh, it's such it's such a great validation. You know, you feel like wow, we did something that that really did stand the test of time, and people really enjoy. And you know, that's really what it's all about. You know, if you if you create art that people can enjoy. And, and, you know, this is the one thing that I always say about our fans, you know, there's no higher honor to me or, or, or any band that the fan, you know, they, they, they spend time and money, you know, on your music, you know, like they have to buy your record or whatever, and they, they spend time listening to it. You know, that's the greatest honor anyone can bestow upon you. And it's something that we will never take for granted. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what I find interesting about how you speak about these things, um, was it important for you? Because you've you've been a very accomplished musician over the years. I mean, you've you've done you've played with so many people. You've played so many styles of music. I think in terms of creativity, you've got to explore yourself a lot. Was it important as you, as I hear you talk about? Uh, the success of Fifth Angel now. Was that important to kind of get that, as you mentioned, validation that that um, the music that you made back then and uh, again now, that it that it resonates with people and it was just an unfortunate kind of uh, accum accumulation of events that kind of, uh, yeah, never never got it off the ground when you first started it? Well, it is, it is. I mean, it's definitely like a homecoming of sorts, you know, and uh, and and it, you know, just to go back and, um, and I'm just trying to figure out how to put this in words. But, yes, it's a very emotional, um, you know, these are these are people that, you know, I've known for years and years and years. And, you know, we're all friends first. 
and uh, you know, musicians second. And, you know, so yeah, it is a, um, I guess homecoming is a very good, good type of, of descriptor for it, but, mm. but it is, uh, it is something that it, I think was important to kind of, you know, revisit. And it started really in, in 2010. And, and I'll tell you a funny story because people said, well, you know, third secret didn't come out till 2018 and the band was, you know, playing back in, in 2010. You know, here's the thing. We were scared because we knew those first two albums were, you know, people kind of held them in very high regard and they had very great respect for those first two albums. And we had written music for a number of years. And to be honest with you, it did not have the same, you know, magic or the same like where you you sit back and you go, oh, that sounds like Fifth Angel, you know, and and it took us a few years to actually develop some some music to where we went. Okay, now this sounds like Fifth Angel again. Now this, you know, it sounds like new Fifth Angel. You know, it's like it, it has these elements, but it sounds like we moved forward and we progressed and we've gotten better, you know, as musicians and, you know, like all of these different things that are woven into the new records. Um, but it took us a while to get there. So so when, when you say, you know, is it something you felt like you had to do? I, I think we did feel like we had to do it. And I think it was a it was a journey and it was a process to get to get to where we felt confident that we really loved the music again ourselves, because when we're making music, um, if we don't love it, you know, like why would anybody else love it? You know? And so when we were making third secret for the first time, we were starting to make music that we go, wow, this is really, I love this. I love, I love listening to this. So hopefully if I love listening to this, you know, other people are going to love listening to it. So we wanted to make sure we loved it first. And so, so it took a while for, for that to happen. <laughs> mm. Well, that, that's good, right? You set the bar high, uh, high for yourselves and your friends. And what I find uh, very cool as well then is uh, then this record now, uh, When Angels Kill. Um, you're very ambitious. Rather, <laughs> than, you didn't just phone it in. It's like, okay, no, we're going to do a concept record. It's going to be 14 songs. It's, the runtime is almost 70 minutes. Uh, what What... What is the atmosphere in the band? Is everybody kind of gung ho now and everybody's like ready to go? Yeah, I think everybody is gung ho. You know, everybody I think is very uh, excited about the new album. I think they're excited about, um, uh, you know, so there's a few things. I mean, we're excited about it. it's a concept record, which I know people aren't real big fan. You know, the thing that now is everybody has the attention span of like 20 seconds, you know? All right. <laughs> like, All right. So, But we did the opposite. You know, we went, okay, everybody has short attention spans. Let's make a really long record that tells a great story, you know, and let's make it, you know, let's put in all the songs and all the interludes and all the different things we want to make it. And, you know, I think it's a kind of album where people have to sit down twice, you know, like it's, it's a double vinyl album. So if you divide it into the two, you know, two albums, you listen, I say, you know, sit back, have a glass of wine, listen to the first album, you know, then maybe the next day, you know, maybe go listen to the, the second album. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that's, uh, I think it's a, it's a very enjoyable experience. I'm looking forward to doing that myself. You know, once we have like the final and everything, I'm going to, because I haven't listened to it really, except for just, you know, we're making videos and things, but I haven't listened to the whole record. So I'm looking forward to trying to be a fan And just, you know, sitting down and just sitting back and listening to the whole record on a great, you know, studio monitor system and, uh, you know, listening to it in my, you know, environment with great speakers and everything. And I'm looking forward to uh, looking forward to doing that. <laughs> What is it like for for a musician of your caliber to listen to himself play? Is it, is it kind of... Can you be very, very objective about it uh, now or or can you still, oh, I should have done this different? I, how, yeah, how do you I mean, feel about listening that, to yourself? That is a problem when you're, you know, because I'm the producer of the band too. So, um, you know, when you when you have been, you know, listening to the, the music for so long, that is a danger, you know, that you're no longer able to listen like a fan and you're going like, oh, I sh you know, should have brought that hi-hat up or I should have you know, that guitar should be louder or, you know, the kick drum is too loud or, you know, like whatever the thing is, you know, that you're listening to, you're analyzing it and analyzing it. And, you know, I did that for so long during the creation of the record that I think I will be able to, you know, now that I've kind of, 
you know, been away from it for a while. I think when we do get it, I'll be able to sit back and listen like a fan. But I will say this, you know, I've heard the record an awful lot and I have enjoyed it. And usually when you have been involved in a record this much, you know, you you want to never hear it again because <laughs> you've you've heard it, you know, a billion times sure. by the time you know it gets gets out to the public. So, you know, normally I would never want to hear anything, you know, that I worked on this much ever again. And, you know, I've when I do hear it, I'm I'm kind of excited about it. Like I feel like, wow, we we made you know, you can always tell when there's life in a record, you know, like when it's there's, you know, it's moving and there's there's emotion poured pouring out of it. And, you know, I always I always think that music, there's a technical end, but there's also the the most the most important thing. The most important thing is, are you feeling something from the music? And and when I listen to it, I feel something from it personally. So hopefully, you know, hopefully there'll be a few million people that agree with me <laughs> <laughs> well obviously that's a great sign the fact that it that it's still fresh to you and you're still enjoying listening to it so finally then i i always perceive wh whether it's wrong or right I, i perceive musicians kind of like athletes in a way where they have to work on their craft every year and they kind of uh, try to tweak things and get better so in the off season so, so to say between albums what was the thing that you worked on as a musician Well, I'm always working, um, you know, as far as uh, my craft, you know, I, I also sing. Um, I obviously write, produce, uh, drum. I love all the different things about music that are available to me, performing live, um, you know, doing solos, you know, just all these different things. I love all, all of it. So for me, um, you know, I'm always working at something. Um, if I'm if I'm working as a producer, I'm trying to be the best possible producer I could be. If I'm working on drums, I'm trying to be the greatest drummer, you know, hopefully ever, you know, I'm, I mean, that's the goal, you know, you set the, you never get it, you know, you'll never be that, but you, you're trying to, you know, do the greatest at everything you do. And so, you know, that I, I would say what I worked on the most in the off season was probably, probably writing, singing and drumming. I'd, I'd say probably the most the you know, where most of my time was spent and, um, And, you know, it, again, it's, it's something that I, I enjoy every aspect of, of the business. The only thing I don't enjoy about the business is probably the actual business. You know, like there are, there are so many, um, you know, it's, it's a different business than what it used to be. You know, uh, now people can just get your album for free on YouTube and listen to everything and not have to buy anything. And, And that's fine. You know, I, I understand that. But it does. I think it does, in a sense, devalue the music. Like I remember growing up and, you know, you'd buy a CD or an album or whatever, um, you know, and it would be you would have value on it because you spent your hard earned money, you know, for this record. And you would listen to every song and you would really get into the album and you would really know the record. And it would be nice to be in that era again. I think music has been to some degree. I mean, there's some great things about the Internet, you know, like we talked about, like Fifth Angel back then. If we would have had the Internet, we could have continued right. reading our fans and putting out music and all that kind of stuff. So there are some advantages. And then I think there's some disadvantages, you know, the disadvantages. There's just so much stuff out there that it's, you know, it's it's very difficult to get people's attention and and have them listen. That's why. For us, you know, again, it's such a great honor when fans do appreciate it. You know, it's just you just go, wow, thank you so much. You know, like, uh, you know, when we, we we were a kid and, you know, there's people that bring up a lot of other records that I played on, you know, hey, can you sign this? And I, and I will sign, you know, like sometimes they bring a stack of things that I've that I've worked on and played on. And I'm more than happy to sit there and sign them because you know, that, that person was honoring to me, you know, they're going, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm spending money, you know, listening to your art. I'm, you know, I'm more than happy, more than happy to sign it. Like I said, we'll never take, uh, we'll never take that for granted. That's very great to you. I have one last question. Um, you kind of talked about what you worked on. Is, is there maybe one piece of drumming or even just a production thing on that ended up on the record that you're really over the moon about something that you're really happy that that it kind of worked out um that's a great question 
there is a there is some really cool drumming. There's there's a song called "The End of Everything." That's the second to last song on the album, and uh, there's some drumming at the end of it that that uh, I kind of you know let loose a little bit and didn't really worry about you know being formula or you know like in the old days you know when we were making the first original Fifth Angels, everybody was like keep it simple, you know, be very basic, you know, don't put in too much stuff. And you know these last two albums, we've been a little more free to just you know do things that we want to do and um so from that perspective you know yeah end of end, everything the ending uh, drum fills I, I i really enjoyed that um i really i really do enjoy like when angels kill like there's some cool drumming in that i, I like uh i like that a lot um there's some really cool stuff in uh in more uh, we are immortal which is uh going to be the third single um and that that song has some really cool stuff too so um, I actually did a, a little tip of the hat to an Alice Cooper record I played on. Uh, there was a song called Lock Me Up, and I used a very similar fill uh, in the middle section uh, that I used on on the Alice record. And uh, so it was a little bit of a, you know, okay. tipping of the hat to that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I actually am, am proud of the record. I'm very, I'm very happy and, and hope, hopefully... Uh, like, like I said, hopefully there's going to be a few million fans that agree with me. <laughs> that would be nice. But I, I think uh, you'll be all right. I think it's, uh, well, this is the exciting part, right? You finished it and now you, you can uh, see what it does in the world. Ken, may I thank you so much for taking time to talk with me? Thank you so much, Robin. You have a great day.